Special Forces. How do the French stack up? Let's go. He's praying. We get to do some extraordinary things. Not everyone is able to jump out of a plane with a boat, land in the water, carry out a marine raid, arrive on land, carry out an action, and exfiltrate by sea. I think that's unique, and that's what I came looking for. So I'm guessing he doesn't want a desk job. What I like is the way we get to push ourselves to the limit, constantly, always searching, innovating, always looking to go the extra mile. It's a unique job within the army, there's no doubt about it. It takes a lot to do this job. There are very few people, unfortunately, with the ability to do what we do, so you have to be able to get the right enjoyment from it. I make the most of it, that's for sure. They do it different, apparently. You don't know their names or faces, yet they're constantly at work in every corner of the globe. Freeing hostages, fighting piracy, arresting war criminals, or carrying out commando raids. The 3,300 men of the Special Operations Command, known as COS, are involved in all kinds of operations, often in the most extreme conditions. We've been invited to follow them as they explain what their unique job entails and their often extraordinary day-to-day -day lives. The soldiers we spoke to specialize in airborne operations, in the language of the Special Forces, the third dimension. So with these guys compared to the SAS, put that in the comments and start the debate. For ensuring freedom of action and infiltration in enemy territory, the third dimension is ideal. It allows stealthy movement, speed and discretion. <laughs> the big differences between the conventional army and a special forces army are in the way we do things, the way we work. We mainly work in small groups. Generally, we go in first to open up a theater, to be able to anticipate and facilitate the arrival of conventional forces behind us. We've got people who are like everyone else, we just work differently. Whether they're part of the Army, Navy or Air Force, the COS units are a group of specially trained units, equipped with the most advanced systems to carry out targeted missions in record time. This is the case with parachutists like Dorian, who carry out high-altitude jumps known as haho jumps. I've been with the RPMA for 16 years now, and I belong to the Aquila group, which is a haho group. I came to parachuting first and foremost for the adrenaline rush, and also because in my job it's an advantage. Some units, like the CPA-10, the parachute commando, complete their specific expertise with a solid grounding in aeronautics. Hmm. Here, Gauthier's team is setting up for what's known as a forward air control maneuver. His group is trained to guide the fire of helicopters or fighter aircraft. From the ground, they designate targets for the aircraft, giving the exact coordinates accurate to a meter. Copy agreed for plus or minus 20 degrees. Major difficulty, ensuring that the team on the ground and the aircraft are both looking at the same thing and calculating the attack coordinates as precisely as possible. To deal with the objective optimally, the CPA-10 teams have recently developed a real-time communication system, allowing them to keep radio transmissions to a minimum. Not sure if she means some kind of texting platform. 
She just mentioned keeping radio communications to a minimum. Capable of seizing and mobilizing an airport to allow the intervention of conventional forces, the men of the CPA-10 can also create a landing strip out of any parts or anywhere in the world. That's the work of the combat controllers on the ground. The roles we perform specifically, unlike other units, are setting up and reconnoitering any kind of rough terrain. We can land an aircraft on terrain we've scouted beforehand. We can create a landing strip in the middle of the desert. That looks like a colossal responsibility. you got to understand how the pilot thinks, the aircraft works, and what could go wrong. Cause you're dealing with a $10 million piece of equipment or more. When it comes to guiding a 50-ton plane traveling at 200 kilometers per hour safely into land, there's no room for improvisation. In the pitch dark, the exercise is even more perilous. Here, the transport plane coming into land is flying with cargo bay and lights lit. Special Forces aircraft usually fly with all lights off, one of the techniques used during Operation Serval, launched in Mali in January 2013. Yeah, that looked like Mali, or the surface of Mars. Can you imagine working in that environment? The first interventions involved crews from the Poitou Transport Squadron. The Poitou took part in Operation Serval, when the Special Forces went in first and was then followed by conventional forces in the main zones that were secured. So that involved landing, taking zones at night where we infiltrated personnel and vehicles in each zone, and then we provided support to the forces put in place for those operations. The Special Forces have been a frontline asset since their creation over 70 years ago. In 1941, the first commandos were already training for lightning raid operations. Dozens of French volunteers were selected to train with the British forces. Under the command of Lieutenant Commander Philippe Kiefer, they went on to become the premier bataillon de fusilier commando, and 177 of them landed on the Normandy beaches on the 6th of June, 1944. Think about this for a second. SF, as we know it today, did not exist until World War II. Fifty years later, after the first Gulf War, the idea of unifying the different commando units took shape. In 1992, France adopted a permanent command structure for these special units the existing Commandement des Opérations Spéciales, or COS. That makes a lot of sense to me. I don't know why we have our SF troops spread out among the different branches and all the bureaucracy involved. Along with the US and the UK, France is currently one of the few countries to have an asset like the COS, with high-level, dedicated air resources. We provide support to COS units on the ground, whether it's by dropping or by landing. We carry out pathfinding missions, which are part of the role of the Special Forces, meaning we're first into the theater, or we exfiltrate COS personnel from hostile environments. We also sometimes gather intelligence for the ground troops and post-action intelligence. I understand the U.S. Army has their own SF aircraft. I'm not sure about the Navy and the Marine Corps. However, I do think this is an outstanding idea. That way all the pilots have the same basis to work from when they're dropping in SF troops. Like the crews of the Poitou Squadron, those of the 4th Special Forces Helicopter Regiment have their own particular areas of expertise. 
We do a lot of intelligence gathering, which allows us to scout the zone and open up a route for other helicopters behind us. Then we carry elite snipers to really provide specific support and surgical strikes during assaults, or to suppress specific threats, and to put the commandos on the ground as closely as possible. We're generally in advance of the other forces. We reconnoitre the zone, give the green light, secure the immediate vicinity around the zone of action, facilitate landing, and we can also provide information directly because we're in contact with the commandos. We give them intelligence about potential threats which might arrive around the zone of action. For rapid infiltration or exfiltration, air assets are essential to the Special Forces units. These action groups use a fast roping technique to descend. Before they arrive in the identified zone, another unit will have gone ahead to gather useful intelligence. I'm team leader with the 13th Parachute Dragoon Regiment. And our regiment specializes in airborne reconnaissance. That means intelligence gathering on targets to allow high-level decisions on interventions, actions, or whatever else. Always working in small groups, the men of the Special Forces need to be extremely versatile. Although they all share the same basic expertise, each of them has ultra-specialist complementary skills. We have to be proficient in the air, at sea, on land, and on land there are a lot of different technical skills. So that requires a lot of training every year, which we can't do without. Otherwise we lose our level of performance and end up at the enemy's level when we go into action. Think about these guys like Olympic athletes. They have to be training constantly, refining their craft, because things move so fast and they get dropped into a spot. Within each group, we're completely autonomous. Each element of the group has their own specialism. The aim is to double up, even treble up if possible, so no one person has just one specialism. We might lose a man in the field, so we need to be able to turn around and accomplish the mission we've been given. That's why our mission preparations are incredibly detailed and fine-tuned, because we're aware of the danger we face. A commando action is by definition carried out by a small group. So everything has to be in order, and we have to predict all the possible enemy reactions that we might encounter in the field. It means trying to think of every eventuality, even if it doesn't happen. But we'll give ourselves as much chance as possible to foresee all the little things that could go wrong in the mission. And how do they know that stuff? Experience. So the guys before them told them, if you're in this situation, Here's what happened bad to us. Don't do that. I would agree with him and say the military is more than just a job. It is a vocation because of what it demands from you. If you're new to the channel, thanks for stopping by. For my current subscribers, I appreciate you. Thanks for watching.